imagine you happen to fall back in time to November 1705 and imagine you happen to have been invited to the Royal Society of London. Then you would have seen an incredible sight. Isaac Newton's assistant, 45-year-old Francis Hawksby, who was an expert in vacuum pumps, demonstrating a strange device with a glass tube on a spindle that he could spin with a handle. Then the room would be dramatically darkened and Hawksby would have spun his glass and placed his hand on the spinning tube and the tube would glow with an eerie purple light that was, according to Hawksby, bright enough to read large print with and be seen from 10 feet away. How did this light bulb work? How did Hawksby think of it? And how did it lead to the battery and to the first bright and long lasting electric light nearly a hundred years later? Well, let me be your time traveler guy, James Burke style. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. So luckily, Hawksby explained his motivation. So in preparation for this talk, he had read a report from a French scientist who had noticed that the top of a barometer would glow when it was shaken. Since a barometer was just a vial of mercury upended so that the top of the tube was a vacuum, Huxby figured that a drop of mercury in a tube that was evacuated with air would glow if he shook it. So that's what he did, and he found to his delight that it did glow a little bit. Then to make it easier to shake, he put his tube on a spindle, which is how he discovered that placing his hand on the spinning tube to stabilize it made a significantly brighter light. Finally, Hawksby realized that by spinning this tube and putting his hand on it, he was creating a lot of static electricity, which he demonstrated in a separate spinning glass with threads in it that would become attracted to the outside of the sphere. Hawksby just needed to add fluorescent crystals to the tube to absorb that purple and the UV light and emit white light instead. And he would have made a fluorescent light bulb that he powered with electricity static electricity. By the way, you too can light up a fluorescent bulb with static electricity. If you use saran wrap to make the static electricity, 26 years after Hawksby's bulb, a rival of Hawksby named Stephen Gray accidentally discovered that electricity can travel when he rubbed the glass tube and a feather stuck to a cork in the tube instead of on the tube itself. Soon Gray was picking up objects at great distances and discovered that some objects conduct electricity, conductors, and some don't, insulators. And if you want stuff to stay electrified, you better hang it up with insulators like silk. To demonstrate this, Gray took a young boy and hung him up with silk thread and electrified him with a charged tube and watched as small objects floated up to the child's hand like magic. Gray then inspired a French scientist named Charles Cisternay de Fay, and de Fay then accidentally discovered that a feather can dance between two rubbed objects if they are made of different materials, and decided that there are two kinds of electricity, which he called vitreous for glass light and resinous for wax light. In determining which category all of the objects he could find fell into, de Fay realized that every solid object he could find, even conductors, could stay electrified if he rubbed it and then put them on an insulating stand. Dufay's work was then read by a dramatic German named Gorg Matthias Boza, who got bored with rubbing tubes by hand and came up with the idea of charging objects on stands with a Hawksby machine after writing a bad poem about how great he was. Boza decided that putting a person on a stand and then electrifying them with a Hawksby machine would be a great way to do crazy human electricity experiments. Like electrifying pretty women with a Hawksby machine and then having men give them shocking kisses. Or my favorite, which I had to recreate, of electrifying himself and then having a spark from his own hand or from a sword light alcohol on fire. Let's watch that again in slow motion. All good. Yay! Boza even created his own electric light bulb. 
which was in the form of a crown that would spark and glow when near an electrified plate. Meanwhile, the King of France was so enamored of these kinds of demonstrations that he elevated his son's tutor, Abbe Nollet, who had also been Dufay's assistant, to be the resident electricity demonstrator at Versailles, although it wasn't exactly an official title. And Nollet created globes filled with different gases that would spark when touched in a beautiful manner called an electric egg. These experiments got even more shocking when Nollet got a letter from his friend, Pieter von Muschenbrock from Leiden, Denmark, sent him a story of how a jar full of water could store electricity from a Hoxby machine and then give it out in such a rush that he wrote, quote, I thought I was done for. He also wrote that he only survived by the grace of God and I would not do it again for all the kingdom of France. Challenge accepted. Nole immediately used his jars to shock everyone, including 200 monks at a oh. time, and made a bit of money on the side selling Leyden jars to other electrical wizards. Meanwhile, in America, youngish Benjamin Franklin became excited about electricity after he heard about the experiments going on in Germany and wrote his friend, I never was before engaged in any study that so totally engrossed my attention and my time. My friends come continually in crowds to see them. I have, during some months past, had little leisure for anything else. Franklin then built his own Hawksby machine, but instead of having a person rub the glass, Franklin's machine used a brush to rub the glass. And Franklin then found that a volunteer could get electrified by touching either the glass or the brush, but not both. As brushes pick up dirt, Franklin decided that the brush was also picking up the electrical fire. So he named the brush's charge to be positive and the glass, as he assumed it lost the electrical fire, to be negative. Franklin also made a lot of unique and fun electricity devices, including a special frame that had a gold foil, which would spark and glow as the electricity flowed through it. One of the first examples of incandescence. Franklin then found the electricity tended to go to and come from sharp points over smooth surfaces and wondered if, as he considered, lightning clouds were made of electricity, then maybe a sharp metal stick could silently drain storm clouds of their electrical fire and save humans from what he called their mischief. But first he had to prove that lightning was electric which he theorized you could do with a large metal stick that wasn't stuck in the ground, but had a little point or kink in it. And if a person could get electricity from that pole during a thunderstorm, then the pole must be draining electricity from the clouds. And lightning must be the same as the electrical sparks they were getting, just on a much bigger scale. In France, Abbe Nollet, the king's electrician, who was also a priest, Abbe means friar thought Franklin's theory of electricity was rubbish. Sparks were sparks and lightning was judgment from God. So some enemies of Nolay decided to take up the challenge and try to steal some of electricity from the clouds. And on May 10th, 1752 in Marley, France, that is exactly what they did. In October of 1852, Benjamin Franklin wrote that he had heard from Europe of the success of the Philadelphia experiment for drawing the electrical fire from clouds by means of pointed rods, but he had done it in a different and more easy manner with a kite. Side note, no, none of them actually drained the clouds of electricity. The rods and the kite were charged with inductance as the electrons at the top of the spikes were repelled by the charges in the cloud but it still worked. In fact, if they had been hit by lightning, they probably would have been killed. Despite or because of the success of the Philadelphia experiment, Abbe Nollet was very upset and he and other religious leaders railed against the lightning rod. In Bologna, Italy, scientist Laura Bossi, who had the town's only Hoxby machine, also became the first in town to recreate the Marley experiment of getting lightning from the clouds. However, when she and her husband tried to install lightning rods, there were actual riots and they had to take them down. Bossy, who was only allowed to earn her PhD to attract attention to the town, wasn't allowed to actually teach at the university. So she instructed her students at home, 
where she was free to teach about Franklin's theories with her electricity machine. And she also set up an outdoor system to study atmospheric electricity, which is how her student, Luigi Galvani, who was a biologist, learned about electricity. 20 years later, Galvani and his wife, who was also a biologist, bought their own Hawksby machine to electrify animals. One day, they placed a dead dissected frog on the table for anatomy lecture, when an assistant, accidentally or for a lark, touched the dead frog with an electrified prong and was shocked to find the dead frog jump. They were therefore galvanized, which is the origin of the term, to electrify every dead animal they could find. And they decided that all life is electric. Just to double check, they took some frog legs outside to see if they would jump in an electrical storm. And one day, the frogs jumped on a calm day and they realized it was a combination of the two metals, the iron and the fence, and the copper wires holding the leg together that caused the frog to jump. When Italy's premier electrician, Alessandro Volta, heard about it, he thought that it was the metal that electrified the frog, especially if he got two different metals to make a live frog jump. And after a few years of playing with it, Volta decided that it only worked when wet. In 1800, Volta proved his theory by making a pile of metals with wet cardboard between them that would give continual shock. No, no. Volta gave his device an odd name of artificial electric organ. So most people just called it a galvanic pile or sometimes after Franklin's term for Leyden jars, a battery. Volta published his paper in England and in France and in Germany and in Italy, basically everywhere. And in England, the secretary for the Royal Society of London let his friend read it. And when that friend named Anthony Carlyle and his friend made a pile, they accidentally found that the ends of the battery would bubble where one end was hydrogen and the other one was oxygen. Batteries could do more than shock. They could also electrically separate chemicals. Volta's discovery happened just weeks before a handsome chemist and poet named Humphrey Davy was given a lectureship at the newly made Royal Society of London. Davy then impressed everyone with his galvanic experiments and then proved Volta's pile worked due to chemistry because the salt water was working as an acid and therefore the battery would be more powerful if it had a more powerful acid in it, which made Davy into a scientific superstar. Anyway, Davy had heard that another scientist had used the battery to make gold and silver glow, just like Franklin did many years before. And Davy also found that a thin slip of platina, which is a platinum alloy, glow with, quote, a vivid light, which is why Davy is often incorrectly credited with discovering incandescence. Then the next year, a Scottish surgeon named William Cruikshank was using a battery for biological experiments and found that his pile kept on falling down. So he placed his pile on its side, called a trough battery. This gave Davy the ability and the idea of making a huge battery with over 2,000 plates of copper and zinc and gallons of acid in the basement of the Royal Institute with wires to lecture hall and to the laboratory. He supposedly put it in the basement because it smelled really bad. In 1806 and 1807, Davy used this battery to increase the number of known elements by 62%. With this giant battery and his chemical experiments, Davy discovered something amazing. If he had two carbon rods and he put a big voltage between them, as he started to separate it, it would make a brilliant light. Davy demonstrated what he called his arc lamp on November 16, 1809. An audience member wrote that the light, quote, was so intense as to resemble that of the sun. It was a dazzling splendor. Suddenly, the over 100-year-old electric light was bright enough and long lasting enough to be useful as public light. However, it still took another 55 years for anyone to make any profit off the arc lamp of Davies and a further 20 years for anyone to make any money off the incandescent bulb. So how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you next time on The Lightning Tamers.
Thanks for watching my video. If you're interested in learning more about these people and where they came from and why they did what they did, I have a lot more videos with more details about like the physics of it and their personal history. So you can get lost watching that. Also, I have a companion book that's gonna come out very, very, very soon, meaning like, I don't know when, but soon. And a big thank you to my Patreons. Thank you, Patreons, for supporting me. If you wanna join their ranks, there's a link down below and you get more details about my book too. Okay, have a good day and stay safe. Bye.